This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library Main Branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Razim with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. Uh, I am here with Nikolai Yakovenko. Uh, those of you who have listened to this podcast before uh, have heard Nikolai uh, speak on Twitter, um, you know, artificial intelligence. We also talked about artificial intelligence and uh, AI for my other podcast for uh, Generate. So, uh, you know, you've probably heard his voice uh, multiple times and his opinions, but um, I keep coming back. Because, uh, well, I mean, he's a good talker, you know, uh, and uh, he is available on short notice because uh, he doesn't have a boss. He is a founder. Um, he has, uh, you know, he's working on uh, Deep News, right, right now, which uh, I do check in on. I have that bookmarked. So you guys should check it out. It'll be in the links. Um, so that's, that's, that's his, uh, his startup. And he is an artificial intelligence guy. So you know, he knows a little bit about it. He knows some of the people. And uh, as I'm recording... It's been a crazy, I don't know, is it like, I don't know, it's like 72 hours? I don't even know. Um, it's been crazy um, to review for you guys who do not know, who sleep under a rock or something. Uh, the uh, CEO, one of the founders of uh, OpenAI, which has revolutionized artificial intelligence in a way, um, kind of bringing it to the mainstream, uh, bringing it to pop culture, make it economically a big deal, um, kind of recentering uh, the tech world around San Francisco um, in a way that it had kind of lost a little bit of its mojo, um, you know, uh, as, as ZERP was ending, uh, you know, zero interest rate period and whatnot. But now it's, you know, there are people who are moving from Miami, Austin, back to SF, or at least doing part-time. And uh, most of these are artificial intelligence people that I know. So you got to be there. That's where the action is or on Mission Street and, and whatnot. You know, there's a bunch of startups. Uh, there's OpenAI. Google has its own thing with Bard, and you know it has DeepMind. Um, so obviously, uh, this is a very, very important field. Um, it's partly important because some people think that um, candidly we are creating a god or something like that, which sounds ridiculous. But I got to put that out there because that is what people are saying, and people are scared, and that's why we're we're actually doing this podcast right now. So Sam Altman. A co-founder, CEO, kind of the charismatic frontman, uh, if it was a, a rock group, uh, of OpenAI, uh, of their leadership, was ousted on um, Friday. So this was three days ago uh, by the board. And this ouster was apparently triggered uh, by uh, kind of like a dispute. Um, this is what the news is saying. I mean, we can get into whether, you know, how with the veracity of this uh, between Ilya Sutzfiger, uh, who is a chief scientist, um, he was working on an alignment problem, and he went to the board, um, and the board included uh, – uh, well, included uh, the chairman and president, Greg Brockman, um, and uh, obviously Adam – or not obviously, Adam D'Angelo. I think the guy um, – he runs Cora, Tasha McCauley, who is famous for being uh, Joshua Gordon-Levitt's wife. I don't know. That was weird. Uh, but, you know, a big, a big deal. Um, both of them are actually very into effective altruism, which I'll talk a little bit about at some point. And then Helen Toner, who uh, is um, is associated with Open Phil, uh, which you know is kind of associated with the rationalist movement, effective altruism, um, somewhat you know some people who are long termists, and uh, you know people have been criticizing, you know who are these people, and, and you know why can they make these decisions? And so what happened was uh, Brockman was not brought to the meeting. Uh, I think he was kicked off the board. Uh, and then uh, Sutzfiker and the other three board members, uh, you know, showed Sam Altman uh, the door. And um, uh, the CTO, uh, who uh, I think, uh, Nikolai, you know, you know the CTO, right, uh, of OpenAI? Mira, no, I, I don't. But... Okay, okay, okay. But you know of her. Okay. So uh, everyone knows of her. Mira Marathi. Uh, Albanian American CTO uh, was made the CEO. She was told the night before. Um, okay, so we have this shuffle. Uh, they basically did not give Altman any notice. So this was—they're calling this a coup. This is this is a coup. Okay, uh, this is how coups work that are good. 
Uh, so it worked because, you know, he was not CEO anymore. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and uh, Brockman resigned, uh, the, the, the chairman and president. Um, and, uh, you know, this is all over social media. Um, you know, my whole timeline was taken over by it. Actually, every single one of my group chats uh, pretty much uh, was talking about it, which is kind of good because uh, – Okay, I'm just gonna say this. Like, I I could take a little bit of break from Gaza talk. You know, just not gonna lie. <laughs> I mean, if you want to talk about silver linings, uh, that was a silver lining. It's just like we we don't need to think about it. I don't need to think about it for three days. Okay, so uh, that's what happened, and the world was trying to figure out um, why uh, there were all sorts of speculation. Um, I was speculating with friends. You know, they were saying like it could be like financial issue. It could be he's trying to raise a hundred million dollars from SoftBank and start a competitor. Um, it could be that they think that they're creating an evil god, and you know um, Sam is too focused on Sam Altman is too focused on shipping product and making profit. Now this OpenAI was founded as a nonprofit. Uh, Elon Musk was originally associated with it. They switched to a for profit, but the board is still a nonprofit board. Uh, so uh, you know, as I said, like you know, it's not a traditional uh, for profit. Uh, you know extremely valuable startup i think it's its value which has decreased was which i think it was estimated like 80 billion um you know it has 700 some technical employees they pay really well uh so they're a big deal in the valley uh in terms of throwing their weight around and um you know everyone was talking uh the whole weekend about how this was going to get resolved and then um rati and some others decided you know what this isn't working. Um, the board needs to, you know, change its mind because uh, a lot of the people that were working at OpenAI and right now, about ninety percent of the people, as of this recording, which is Monday, ninety uh, percent of the technical employees have signed on that that they will go to the exits if Altman, um, you know, is not the CEO, and they were trying to bring him back. Microsoft is an investor, and I think it was Strive or Thrive, uh, one of the VCs. Um, the investors wanted him back because uh, its capitalization, you know, this is not a good look, quote unquote, uh, for a private business. Uh, they wanted him back uh, by five on Sunday. That didn't work. Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, offered an alternative um, right now as of Monday where basically, um, you know, they're going to start their own uh, division headed by Altman. Presumably, the idea is they're going to get a lot of the employees that are at OpenAI, and so OpenAI's biggest investor is going to be Microsoft, and then they have a competitor of its ex CEO. That seems really strange. Uh, some people are saying that actually this is just a way to keep Microsoft stock, uh, you know, not super volatile and stable until they figure out a way to get Altman back. Uh, as I'm recording, there's still word that he's trying to get his position back, and then Twist. Um, Ilya Sutzvaker, who triggered, from everything we know, triggered all of this, uh, has changed his mind <laughs> and uh, apologized. And, um, you know, we have pretty much like every employee that's on social media saying things, you know, they're saying um, open AI is, is people uh, in terms of, you know, their labor force, right, who are totally not on board with what the board wants to do. Okay, so just been talking for a while, and I'll just say like about the board. Um, there has been speculation that you know some of this is uh, you know doomer, long termist, effective altruism, uh, you know gone wild. Uh, the other case that's happened in the last year is FTX, uh, and uh, basically the idea is uh, decel, decelerate uh, technological change, um, and be it's because you know they're they're going to cause. They're going to cause the birth of an evil god and, you know, all of this stuff. We've talked about, the, you know, Nikolai and I have talked about this on the podcast, but this is really what some people are saying. Eliezer Yudkowsky, kind of like the uh, guru of the D-cells and Doomers, uh, definitely was happy that Altman was uh, expelled and, um, you know, praised Ilya and, uh, you know, the board. Um, I, Helen Toner, uh, was very young, open fill, uh, former open fill employee, has gotten a lot of, uh, um, criticism i think some of it's like pretty mean and unfair uh in terms of like oh she has no credentials and all this stuff and you know uh, i actually asked uh, around because i do know people that know her and i think her mentors i actually do know um she is extremely into effective altruism 
Uh, and uh, she is a moderate, probably Doomer, maybe, is what I've heard. Uh, not like an extremist. I mean, why would she be on OpenAI uh, on their board if she was an extremist? You know, she want, otherwise she would blow it up or whatever they are going to do. Um, and uh, she's not um, – she's sincere and earnest, okay? So I uh, just, like, you know, give her her due. Uh, I think, um, you know, there's some talk that Aaron, Adam D'Angelo – and I apologize for all, like, the political stuff, but Adam, Adam D'Angelo has Quora. And that's actually competitive, and uh, maybe he's trying to deep six OpenAI, so that Quora, which is working on its own bot, uh, is you know more viable. I don't know. Um, it's just really confusing because you know I pay uh, for ChatGPT, the uh, you know subscribe subscription. Um, I use it a lot. Uh, not I don't know, not every ten minutes, but like probably every couple of hours at minimum. So. Um, like many people, it's part of my life uh, now. Uh, I kind of take it for granted. And, you know, Google is integrating its own, uh, you know, this like natural language or whatever, artificial intelligence, you know, bot aspect into its search. So it's it's changing technology. It's doing a lot of things. And then there's the whole other aspect, this like technical aspect of, well, NVIDIA stock, uh, all the GPUs, the GPU limitations. Uh, this is such a rich, rich... Um, I don't know, uh, topic that uh, I think at this point I'm going to stop because I've been talking for a while. Uh, I hope you guys could follow what I said because I said a lot of different things, but uh, a lot of people have not slept over the weekend. And, uh, you know, this is this has been uh, – you know, we live in interesting times. Nobody died. Uh, it was, I didn't watch the show, but, like, you know, there's, like, these shows uh, – you know, about like business and, you know, there's like, what was that HBO show about like the Murdoch Sushi. family? So it's like, you know, people are saying like, this is like an HBO business drama show. Um, and, you know, one thing people are saying about uh, a Sam Altman, and I don't know Altman, but I know people that know him, uh, is that he is uh, a very Machiavellian uh, person who obviously can ship really fast. He's a good CEO, but, uh, you know, in terms of his... Uh, <laughs> Uh, his ethical center, like, you know, getting shit done is more important than, uh, you know, necessarily always being candid with the people around him. So uh, people are saying, well, you know, I mean, this is this stuff is going to follow him wherever he goes because, you know, he's 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 an operator and, you know, he ruffles a lot of feathers. So uh, in any case, um, this is where we are right now. Uh Nikolai, I've been talking. Um, what do you have to say for the situation, uh, the people, like your evaluation, your take, and uh, where you think we're going to go? Sure. So first of all, I, I do kind of agree that it's not over yet. Um, to sort of recap what happened, what was announced was there was a deadline yesterday that did pass for Sam to come back. Um, it could not be agreed to. What was reported was that Sam said, fine, I'll come back. But basically, I want everything I want. I need to get everything I want, which basically means replacing the board and, you know, fixing, so to speak, this this messed up corporate structure, which we'll get into in a second, and sort of how it came to be and why it's here. I do think that story is interesting. Um, apparently, he didn't get it. Meanwhile, the board, while firing itself, agreed to that, but like was also like we want input into the new board, and they also at the same time hire this like new interim CEO, the. Uh, <laughs> The ex Justin TV gentleman uh, Emmett here, who you know who's 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 a, who's a real person, a real player. I mean, to be honest, I didn't know very much about him, but I guess people, uh, you know, Twitch uh, so people certainly have an opinion. Yeah, yeah the ex ex CEO of Twitch, which is a big deal for the gamer nerds out there, which I'm not, but uh, the gamer people know him. He apparently was very very hands off and not very involved. This is what people are saying, but whatever. But well, people were saying. Actually, people said sort of two things. What I heard on some on, on like listening to way too many hours of Twitter spaces was that at the beginning, he was like extremely hands on and was extremely hands on into everything and micromanaged everything. And at some point, he just like burned out and, and was completely hands off. <laughs> so people listening to this are like, this doesn't sound like a like like a like a thing. I mean, all, all I've learned about him since is that apparently he's a prolific poster and people are just retweeting just all kinds of you know, very spicy tweets that he's been putting out for years, which which I've never understood. I actually kind of admire being an effective CEO and having that much time to post. I mean, maybe Rajiv, maybe you can relate to that, but I can't personally, you know. Well, I, okay, another thing that I will say about this guy, um, I don't know much about him, but, uh, you know, people are just, you know, saying he's an empty suit or whatever, but uh, I, I do know. Oh, definitely not. 
I, I do know, I mean, he's actually relatively based, as we would say. Um, he's not he's not all about the current thing. I do respect that. Um, and also, you know, why would you step into this? I mean, he's rich. You know, why? So, you know, I, I give him his due. Uh, you know, maybe he thinks he can do something. Uh, he is going to be a king of, uh, of an empty empire, an empty kingdom soon, though, uh, because people are leaving or they're threatening to leave or they're just not going to do work. I know that um, the employees have said that, you know, even if they're kind of like pseudo, like quiet quitting or striking, they will keep all the basic functions going for ChatGPT because they feel like uh, people like me who are paying, you know, we got to get what we're paying for, right? Uh, they don't want to destroy confidence in artificial intelligence and these chatbots. But um, yeah, you were talking, I just kind of interrupted, but in terms of where we're going potentially. Yeah, I mean, just, just to finish that thought that you were saying, I mean, I, I actually think that, yeah, I think one of the dumbest points of view, which is being pushed by some people that we know, is that ChatGPT is going to like stop working tomorrow. And I think that's ridiculous. I don't think it's going to happen. In fact, I would go further. Like, like I think that even if employees left to work for Sam, Sam will tell them, hey, like, do whatever you need to do to keep the chat GPT like service and API working. It would be such a black mark on them. And I think they feel personally responsible for it. I do think they really care. I think like, to be honest, as a user, I don't think that, I think, I think I've been treated pretty well as an API user. I don't think everything's been great, but I really do think since they sincerely care, it's a first of its kind product. They wouldn't, they wouldn't just kill it out of apathy or spite, you know? And, and frankly, it doesn't take that many people to run chat GPT. What takes a lot of people is building GPT-5 and building the GPT store and building the new stuff. Like, let's be honest, like taking an existing product that works and replicating across more GPUs, Microsoft people can do that. They don't need any open AI people to do that, actually, let's be honest. So I think it's a ridiculous point of view. I think there's a lot of doomerism. I don't think chat GPT is going to die. The real question is like, will open AI be a zombie organization? I think the default assumption is probably yes, unless it's reunited. So that's the other thing that's come out is that, you know, the news that of course dropped today, you know, Reuters and others are reporting that, you know, that, um, you know, uh, that investors are suing the board as of course they should. I mean, I think that as much as I agree that people have been piling on to people's credentials and being kind of mean to the board, I think that's not very nice. But at the same time, like, I don't know where the hell they got their legal representation. Their statement was inflammatory and made no sense. And like, I don't think they had a lawyer in the room. I, I like people like read the bylaws. I don't even think the way they, they did it, like even follows their own bylaws. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, as, as a, as a mentor of mine said, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you think that people, when they get older, they act in more mature ways, but I think as you and I know, that's not really the case. So I think it's like pretty fair yeah. to assume, you know, without proof, of course, that this was perhaps a petty grievance. Obviously, as you pointed out, as a lot of people have pointed out, as Ben Thompson pointed out in his show, which basically means people told to him that a lot of people had their issues with Sam. He was obviously a big shot. He was a big star. He was obviously like doing deals outside of OpenAI. Everyone knew about that. And, you know, um, and if the board wanted to, you know, wanted to handle it, they should have handled it differently. Like they've, they've. I mean, even though they don't have a fiduciary duty to the investors, they have the res responsibility to the foundation and the open AI, you know, and, and the open AI foundation, which is advancing, you know, AI for humanity, whatever the hell that means, you know, like they still, you know, caused a lot of people, a lot of economic damage. I mean, the, the reality is that, you know, when I worked on Wall Street, I mean, anytime there was an acquisition and someone lost money, certain, you know, they would always get sued. So you, you can't create a transaction where people lose money, like like even millions of dollars and you don't get sued. Here you're talking about tens of billions of dollars. I mean, what about the employees who had who had their sort of like, you know, sort of fake stock, let's just call it. Crypto people understand exactly what we're talking about, but they have this like stock that's not a real equity, but it's kind of equity and at a secondary value. You know, some of them were able to sell it in the secondary, some were not. Um, you create this weird situation, right? Like, and you're talking about, you know, costing people I mean, my understanding is some of the early employees, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, this is real money. Like you, 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 you it doesn't matter how good your reasons were, like you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to defend them in court. So I, I, I don't, I don't see how this thing is over to be honest, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still ongoing, uh, in terms of the board, uh, they really have not been clear, uh, in a precise way of what their rationale was. So that's why 
Uh, I think, not I think, all of Friday was spent. Uh, people were speculating about you know se- sexual abuse allegations from Sam Altman's sister. Uh, people were speculating about the whole Saudi thing. People were speculating about his side hustles and side startups. Uh, people were speculating about so many different things, and it's because uh, the board um, was not clear. Now, I do want to say, uh, I just want to check, <clears throat> ChatGPT, uh, I asked uh, what happened to OpenAI in the wake of Sam Altman firing, and it, it, ChatGPT responded. So uh, let me just like read this, just see what like ChatGPT itself thinks, okay? And then you can comment on it, Nikolai. Um <clears throat> The firing of Sam Altman from OpenAI led to significant developments and upheavals within the company. Altman was dismissed by, as a CEO by the OpenAI board of directors, followed by the resignation of the company's longtime president and co-founder, Greg Brockman, as well as three senior researchers. Chief scientist of OpenAI, Ilya Sisvaker, played a pivotal role in the events, including informing Brockman of Altman's firing. Following the firing, OpenAI's COO, Brad Lightcap, clarified that the decision was not due to malfeasance, but rather breakdown in communication between Altman and the board. This led to uncertainty around the company's future, including the potential jeopardy of a planned sale of OpenAI employee shares that could have valued the startup at $86 billion. So it's you know, rounded up to $90 billion. Then I, th- I said $80 billion. Altman was reportedly planning a new venture, potentially an AI chip startup, with Brockman expected to join. Amid investor pressure and internal dissent, there were discussions about reinstating Altman and Brockman at OpenAI, but these plans faced resistance from the board. Eventually, Altman confirmed he would not return as CEO, and Emmett Shear, co-founder of Twitch, was appointed as interim CEO. Altman, along with Brockman and other colleagues, then announced they would join Microsoft to lead a new AI research team. This series of events also saw a significant number of OpenAI employees, including Sutzberger, including Sutzberger, so the guy who triggered <laughs> triggered this whole shit show, uh, threatened resignation until the, unless the board reinstated Altman. Additionally, there was a proposal for a potential merger. I don't know this with Anthropic. I didn't hear I, this. I, I've never heard of that. Another large language. Uh, this might be like hallucination. Uh, another large language model developer, but this was not pursued. The entire episode highlights the complexities and challenges within leading AI organizations. Okay, whatever. Most of that, um, I think, is what we said. Um, the last part about Anthropic, I, I have not heard. So uh, why don't you comment on that? I'm going to look up the Anthropic thing as you're talking. Uh, so com- comment on, on what? The, the, G- the GPT? Yeah, just comment on, like, do you think that that's a fair representation of what happened? I mean, a lot of it's I mean, pretty generic. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I think I think that actually kind of highlights some of the, you know, kind of like uh, you know, we very quickly went from this state of like, wow, the dog is able to talk to like nitpicking, you know, how how good the 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 dog is reporting the news, um, and I I think that's I think that's what what it's saying is relatively accurate. Um, I think at the same time, nobody would read that and feel satisfied, right? Like it it, it there there's 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 a bunch of things missing there. There's a bunch of sort of rel- re- relatively small and random details. Like, like who informed, like who ex- informed Brockman doesn't really matter, does it? Like the things that really matter to a human are like, what happened? Why? Where are we going? I mean, it doesn't really, really get into the Nadella thing very much. So I would say it's a decent oh. summary. I would say it's, I, I think it's like a seven out of 10. Okay. So that, the anthropic thing was not a hallucination. Uh, I just looked it up three hours ago. You were out, you know. I was doing other things. Uh, believe it or not, we're not tracking this twenty four seven. The information, um, uh, Stephanie Palazzo, Palazzolo, uh, stories titled "OpenAI's Board Approached Anthropic About a Merger," um, and so yeah, the board of directors approached Dario Amadai, the co-founder okay. and CEO of rival large language model developer Anthropic, and you know, um, most of people, some of the well, actually, actually very few people will probably know this, but Dario Amadai. He left in 2021 because of safety concerns. That was that was what I heard. Um, he was with OpenAI. I actually know Dario Amadai. I, I don't. We're not friends or anything, but like I used to hang out with him a fair amount. I talked to him about his concerns about uh, artificial intelligence and its dangers and things like that. Uh, you know, I, he lived in a group home with. Uh, I mean, this is public knowledge, so I think I can say it. With Holden Karnofsky of GiveWell and then Open Phil. So I actually know a lot of these people personally from 10 years ago when I lived in the Bay Area. And uh, I know what their concerns are. And, you know, 
I know that you don't like necessarily find it very credible. And I feel like, you know, Perry Metzger has also has computer scientists has also said similar things. Most computer scientists are not uh, EA doomers in any way. Uh, they don't really find it credible to think that in five years, artificial generation, ge- artificial general, like this is the kind of thing that they're thinking about. Artificial general intelligence will wake up, have godlike powers, and transform the whole universe into cheese, and everyone's going to go extinct in five years. Uh, that's kind of a ridiculous example, but it's the kind of thing some people are worried about. They're worried about the creation of an evil god. Um, so anyway, a little news uh, for you guys who are listening. Yes, there was a uh, anthropic potential merger. Now, if the board is approaching anthropic, um, anthropic itself is very valuable, by the way, um, like billions and billions. A- anthropic might, and I think uh, FTX, you know, say, uh, um, you know, uh, Bankman Fried invested in anthropic. If he had like waited, maybe not filed for bankruptcy, he might, you know, kind of be whole ish. But in any case, anthropic itself is very valuable, um, and so. Uh, um, it's interesting to me because, uh, you know, Toner in particular is connected to that whole scene, the whole social network of people. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, they're they're really close uh, personally. Um, uh, the Open Phil people, Dario Amadai, um, and then Toner is from. Oh, I don't know her, but um, I've asked around about her. Uh, so <laughs> this is just like really weird because it's like. They reached out to the fr- a friend and was like, hey, can you rescue this from us? That's what it sounds like to me because I know Dario knows, knows Toner in particular. I'm sure he does, you know, because uh, I think her mentor was – is his friend, you know. But in any case, um, that's what's going on there in the news. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's, say, let's talk about the science a little bit because we've been, like, going on. And if, if there's any updates, like, I'll actually, like, use Google or Bing or whatever – to, like figure out if there's anything new. Although like I have been trapping social media in one of my one of my browser windows or one of one of my monitors. So I, I haven't seen anything new. But um in terms of the science, can we talk again? I we've talked about this before, but let's talk about it again. Uh the number of GPUs needed for training, uh getting the weights, and then how many GPUs do you need to keep running, right? So my understanding is, you know, they need all this juice and they need the collaboration with Microsoft or Google or somebody. Uh, because no startup is going to be able to get the GPUs. Uh, you know, some someone literally said they think half of uh, and like tell tell people what a GPU is, but like half of half of Microsoft's GPUs or something uh, might go to OpenAI and whatever Altman's going to do. You know, um, like it's that intense. There ha- and like I I did read in the news that uh, Microsoft uh, started being a little stingy about allocation with other other resources because of open AI. Uh, this is a very, very energy or, you know, compute intensive activity. Tell me what a GPU is and then, you know, comment on um, just like the logistics of, okay, like if everyone moves to Microsoft, you know, do they get the weights? Do they not get the weights? These sorts of things. Sure. So yeah, I think I think on a high level, we can talk about it. I mean, some of the numbers, of course, open AI, you know, as ironic by their name, which everyone keeps pointing out, is not very open about things. So they've actually never said, you know, exact numbers. People sort of rumor it. They're written down places, but they've never said exactly how big these models are. You know, you know what exactly they're trained on for how long, et cetera. Um, I mean, de- definitely training these models is extremely GPU intensive. So GPU is just a, it, it, you know, it's it just a computer that's that's optimized for parallel uh, computation, right? So they were developed originally for graphics and the obvious insight there being is that it, you, as much as it seems quote unquote wasteful, if you calculate every pixel on the screen independently, then you can sort of scale things. You don't want to calculate them as a grid, like line by line. Um, so like your, 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 your Intel CPU or the CPU on your phone would like calculate them like at a line at a time. And the reality is you can just do kind of dumb processes much more efficiently in a grid way. Um, so the way these chips are built actually use like multiple dimensions and things like that. But the, the, you know, the, so I I don't know exactly how many GPUs it takes to train these things. Um, there's also kind of an issue of training versus inference. So obviously these models take, take a lot more effort to train than to just inference, i.e. interpret them in new data. But I think what you're talking about is GPUs are also used for inference. So you could in theory just inference them on a CPU, but that would take too long. 
And those of us who use GPT-4 know how long it is already. So, so like, it's kind of, I, I can absolutely understand the situation where these GPUs have to sort of sit around, be hot, you know, be pre-allocated just in case Razib decides to ask, you know, you know, like, like, tell me, you know, tell, tell, tell me a, an insensitive joke or something like that. And then it's going to say, sorry, Razib, that's against my safety policy. And, and for that, it has to just be sitting around and, and, and waiting. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of, kind of how it goes. I mean, now I think the rumor was that GPT three and a half, um, which I guess is sort of being phased out, but it's still pretty useful in the, in the API. Those of us for API users actually use it quite a bit because it's much faster, much, much cheaper. And in a lot of tasks, not that human distinguishable between GPT-4. So that one is rumored to actually not be a very big model. It's rumored to be only a 20 billion parameter model, which is like legitimately something you could run yourself. Inference, obviously not trained, but inference on the highest end NVIDIA hardware. Um, so it's actually not that big. Now, GPT-4 is orders of magnitude bigger, but how many, it's hard to know, I think, from the papers that we've seen about other models, like we've read about people publicly at um, you know Nvidia and um, and Microsoft training on sort of pods of, I think I want to say 256 GPUs wired together. You know the reality is you can't really scale these things to too many GPUs for training because the communication gets too slow, um, and these models are so big, like each basically each individual layer, so every layer of the neural net, like please don't make me explain that. Um, is actually scaled between multiple GPUs. So like, basically there's only so many GPUs you can wire together to sort of share the same big matrix multiplication. And once you get past that, it's not really efficient. So that what they will do, they'll have multiple of these, you know, 128 or 256 GPU pods that work together in different parts of the data and they sort of share the weight updates. And, and the training can be quite large. You're talking about training it on, you know, billions of documents, right? Um, but I think the part that we're really interested in, which is really inference, I mean, inference is a fraction of the cost of, of training, um, mostly so, because- wait, you know, wait, wait, Give me a sense of the fraction, like 20%, 2%? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think very naively, the same exact thing would be about a quarter, you know, because there's just, basically the reason is very simple. Like when you're training it, you need to sort of save the forward and the backward class so you can back propagate it. Um, and that requires a lot of sort of caching and some extra memory, right? Um, you can, of course, sort of cheat by, you know, all of these operations. Remember, I mean, they, Microsoft has been doing for a while, even when I was in NVIDIA, like any sort of data that's in the G, basically they're all, they're all, uh, they're bound by RAM, right? They're round by, by, by memory from GPUs. So people have done fundamentally caching, right? Also, the other thing is you can take the memory, you can offload it on CPU, and as long as you're sort of loading it by pieces. And then the third thing is NVIDIA has just shoved a shitload of RAM into the new GPUs. So the new GPUs, they're like, you know what? They're not much faster, they're not much bigger. I mean, they are, but they're like, let's max out the RAM, you know? So like when, 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 when deep learning really took off, um, you know, the GPUs didn't have that much RAM because you didn't need that much RAM for, um, for uh, computer vision, really, you know, for, for rendering, um, you know, these, uh, you know, like your screen. And as people got into these transformer models and multi-layer stuff, like people are always maxing out the RAM. So NVIDIA has complied by like giving them a lot more RAM. And then also like different different levels of cache. So you can, so you can all sort of offload it within the GPU or get, send it all the way to CPU and retrieve it efficiently. So um, like actually there's been quite a bit of innovation in that space in the last couple of years. Yeah, so, but, but I mean, yeah, the, the, the simple answer is not, yeah, you're not saving 98%. Um, but you're definitely going to save, you know, eighty percent, right? Or, or maybe, maybe, maybe even more. But but the bigger issue is, you know, when you're training the model, you're training it for a long time on a huge number of documents. When you inference it, you know, you don't have to do that, right? Yeah. Um, so I just checked. Um, I was just curious. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it says that a New York Times said last year, no, not last year, like uh, a month ago, ten uh, ten. That uh, in 2027, AI servers would use 0.5 percent of the world's current electricity usage. So yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. But yeah. It's not like 10 percent. You know, I mean, people are 
people are uh, some people are really freaking out about the environmental impact and and all these other things. I actually did not know that it would be that percent. So it's not trivial. Um, it looks like right now, um, Google and you know probably mostly Google, uh, Google and Amazon. Their cloud and Google search and Amazon's cloud and Google search engine uses about one to one point three percent of the world's electricity, which I think is is reasonable. That makes sense. Well, it, 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 and it's also like like I mean I'm not I don't want to get into the whole Bitcoin argument, but like obviously you can choose where to put the data center. So for example, you know you as an Oregonian would would know about all the all the data centers that were installed in Eastern Oregon because they had good weather. Um, they didn't really need to be cooled that much. It was kind of dry and like sort of the right weather. And also, I guess they had access to hydro, I think was sort of, I mean, I remember when, when yeah. I was at Google, they were absolutely starting to build these data centers and sort of the Oregon Washington border, you know, and what, you know, wherever, wherever they can basically get hydro. Um, yeah. So uh, the hydro, this is just like a little twist that uh, people don't know, but uh, you know, I don't think Intel does money, much manufacturing in the Pacific Northwest, but it has like a huge, huge office in Beaverton. And so uh, it was originally, uh, you know, and Boeing also is in Seattle for the same reason. Uh, so cheap, regular electricity, Bonneville Power Association. Also, uh, water is an input uh, into manufacturing, and uh, you have to purify water, um, and that requires energy inputs. And uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, the water there is extremely – it's not hard. It's very, very pure already. So that reduces uh, the the – purification process compared to somewhere else so um i don't know if it's like a big deal now but that was one of the reasons originally oh, no, they, they still have chip plants in, in in oregon and in fact um, that's always the place that's sort of mentioned for you know new high-end fabs in america would be you know i i even remember gelsinger talking about it you know and ben thompson being like well people complain about the water thing we'll just put the plant in a place where there's plenty of water where it's not a problem like 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 don't think about california basically it was what he was saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, when I go back to Oregon, um, I do have to say, like, one of the first things I do when I land, uh, probably not the airport, but you know, when I go, go to a house or something, is uh, I, I get a cold, because it's, it's just really cold, glass of water, and I drink it, and I taste it, because that's what water should taste like. You know, uh, when, when I lived in California, when I lived in Davis, that was not great water. Uh, you know, I love Austin, but uh, not as bad as Davis. That was really bad, but it's not great water. A lot of people here just, well, you know, especially millennials uh, and Zoomers, just they do bottled water. They don't even drink regular water, you know. But uh, anyway, that's, that's a tangent. Uh, and going back to the technological aspects. Um, okay, so we have this disruption. We're recording now. We don't know everything that's going to shake out. Um, if Sam Altman goes back and then uh, Mira... And Brockman, everyone will go back. If Ilya is chill now, we can, you know, aside from the board, it seems like it'll just be back to status quo, right? Um, I mean, maybe, pro pro not quite. I mean, so first of all, the board is a real issue, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the corporate structure, which maybe not everybody would know, was sort of how we got here, right? So, so OpenAI was started all the way back in 2015, which is actually two years before Transformers were even invented. So kind of just as this open sort of uh, uh, research group, so sort of the, you know, somewhat cynical, but I think truthful representation was that they were like, look, Google and Facebook are sort of monopolizing AI stuff, which again, wasn't even as powerful then, but it was already a thing. And, you know, you have sort of Tesla and Netflix and whatever, and all these groups, like they're building their own AI group, but that's hard. They're fragmented. They can't really compete with Google, you know, or even Facebook, but certainly Google. So it's like, why don't we form a consortium? And why don't we make it public and open and sort of like for the greater good? And that'll be an attractive thing. Um, Elon famously put up basically $40 million. That number has been mentioned a lot over the weekend, uh, over a period of time. He was on the board. He was involved at one point, perhaps he even controlled the board and had his own people running the company or not. It depends how you interpret it, but he was very influential. Um, and then, you know, there was, you know, I, I believe in, in uh, 2018, sort of he left over some spats. Uh, I remember Elon publicly are, uh, fighting with, you know, your, your, your friend Dario online. That was a thing. Uh, some of us remember that. Um, ironically, of course, Dario also left later, but basically Elon left and more importantly, Elon's money left, you know? And, you know, this was a proper 501c, you know, kind of like 
you know, anybody who's an academic knows that, you know, their friends and, you know, parents salaries get published in a newspaper. Like that was a thing. People were like, oh my God, they're paying, you know, Karpathy 600K or whatever it was, you know, but like, it really was a proper non nonprofit that was funded by basically Elon and a couple of other people, you know, but it was spending a lot of money and it didn't have that many people. Um, so then basically under Sam, they were like, okay, we want to do this AI stuff. We need to raise money. How are we going to do it? Well, we can't do it as a nonprofit, <laughs> you know, we have to do something else. So they basically created like, you know, it was a little bit controversial at the time, but they created, you know, open AI LLC or whatever it was called, which was a, a regular, which is a regular company. Um, and they could raise money for that company and they basically had a deal. So, you know, Microsoft and other investors put it in, it was a cap profit. It wasn't like a proper capitalist company, but sort of, so they could put it in. They're just sort of capped and they can only make a hundred X of their money. And they're basically a deal where the company was still, you know, run by, by the board, by the same original nonprofit board, but they had this sort of like for-profit structure. And that had sort of changed even more and more over time. So like, I think at the very least for, for, for Sam to come back, I mean, you'd have to get rid of that structure and, you know, anybody who's unhappy with that would have to leave. Right. You know, like that, 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 yeah, yeah. that, that dog and pony show can't go on anymore. I'm sorry, but like, yeah, it, just, it wasn't working. Like, I don't even think people who are for it, like it wasn't functional. You can't have, I mean, we're seeing it now. I mean, you can't have, you know, VCs put in hundreds of millions and Microsoft put in billions and, and have the whole thing be run by this board that's accountable to humanity. It just like, like, that's not, that's not a legal standard. Like <laughs> it's, it's, you can't just do that, you know? Like, and, and what happens now? Like just, you know, people were even speculating about this today. Like if say like it got liquidated or something and then like this, this, this nonprofit got a windfall of, you know, some billions or something, like they just say it worked out. Like what then? <laughs> like nonprofits are not supposed to have billions. Like the IRS yeah. kind of doesn't like that, you know? Yeah. So, that, you know, what you're talking about here is like misalignment in a way, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, so, you know, when you're in, um, when you have, you know, you don't have any co-founders, right, Nikolai? I think I remember him. No. With the current, so it's just you. You are perfectly aligned with your, because you don't have multiple personality disorder. But in any case, um, when you have, I have, I have two co-founders, uh, and I think, um, you know, people usually say one to three. You know, uh, you know, anything above three, it's there's some scalability issues. Actually, OpenAI had didn't have six or something. It had a lot, but in any case, um, but the there's no equity. There's some weird for Sam. I don't know the details there, which is that's weird. But um, so there's a lot of weird things there. But um, the point with is when you have co-founders, uh, you got to be aligned on the same vision. Uh, what's the point in putting your life into a company if you guys have different visions? Like now, the visions will diverge. It's common for co-founders to eventually drift apart or whatever. I mean, that's not a big deal. Uh, the board again, um, it should be aligned with the interests of the company. You don't want to be on a board of a company where you don't agree with what they're doing. And uh, I think what had happened. Uh, at this point is, um, you know, they're, they're accelerating, they're accelerating, uh, with, uh, you know, with the API, uh, you know, I think, uh, what is it like, uh, chat, the GPT two or three uh, GPT two, it wasn't, it was okay. It was kind of interesting, but I remember having conversations with friends and they're like, eh, it's kind of meh, you know, and then like three and then definitely four um amazed us you know i mean just people are using it they're engaging with it uh you know and it's useful it's useful you know uh people need to be careful there are some shortcomings which we've all talked about like hallucinations blah 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 but i think it's pretty useful um and so uh the new version with gpt4 it has dolly and stuff like that and i actually have never used it for an image as i was talking to you i realized oh i should just try it out and uh, it's pretty good dolly's pretty good but um in any case i uh, yeah, the board, you know, I was just assuming there'd have to be a new board. That's part of the issue. I think um, Altman wants to bring in Reed Hoffman and, and a few other people, just as the usual, you know, crew of, of Silicon Valley heavyweights probably uh, because the company is a heavyweight company now. By the way, Anthropic has 100 employees and it's worth like $4 billion. It's, so it's not like – when you have a billion-dollar company, it's not trivial. So Anthropic's kind of a big deal too, um, but it's, you know, about an order of magnitude, like actually like, you know, less but whatever uh than uh than open ai so that would be kind of a weird merger um in any case although open ai is worth a lot less now 
The other option is, uh, you know, Altman is not going to. So Altman was, there's rumors that he was going to start his own thing, you know, raise money from SoftBank and the Saudis, the only people that could like really capitalize him at the level he would want. But it looks like the other option is somehow to go to Microsoft. Um, and so we, you talked about this earlier. Um, we alluded to it. Uh, you know, does this, is this an opportunity for Google? Uh, I will say with Google uh, and Bard, which you know, kind of sucks. It's gotten better, but um, what, what's going on there? I, I did say this, I think, in the previous podcast that we did on this topic, but I, I will say it again because I'm not going to identify the person. But um, I asked on social media, I asked on Twitter, X, you know, what's up with this? Why is it? Why is it such? Why is it so lame? Um, you know, because it's just like Bard at the time to ChatGPT 3.5 was like uh, a Japanese uh, 1980s uh, Japanese uh, car, so pretty good car, uh, to a Soviet car, you know? It was just, it wasn't trivial. Like, Bard was just not good, okay? You kind of felt like, why are you using Bard? Oh, well, you're at Google, you know? Uh, Bing, Bing's, uh, I forget, what, what's, what's Bing's uh, thing called? What's she called? I, I I don't remember what Bing's called. I thought it was just a sort of a a weaker version of yeah. Chat, like it's yeah. now it's integrated yeah. into ChatGPT, yeah. so yeah. I don't I don't use it independently. But anyway, the, the point is, um, it was much better, I would say. And you know, they have like different safeguards and all these things. But now, <clears throat> so so, but Google had all of these, um, you know, uh, you know, things, uh, you know, all these features years and years ago. But um, you know, their company. Because their management, like you know, company of meetings, they're very paralyzed. Uh, they, they don't move fast. Uh, they still don't like really haven't pushed the frontier yet. But maybe they got a shot. Um, you know, comparing Satya Nadella to Sundar Pichai, and like candidly, like I didn't know who was who for the longest time. Uh, now I know. And now you do. Now you do. Now I do because like Satya Nadella is. Uh, I mean, he's a man. You know, in terms of like. He's like rolling with it. He's rolling with it. What's the different time? It was like, a, it was like a Monday. I think it was like Sunday night. It was Monday morning. They announce uh, like whatever Microsoft is like working on this thing with Sam Altman coming in and stuff like that. And um, you know, everyone was like, "Wow, Satya is like really shining." And and uh, someone's like, "Yeah, someone should sell Sundar, but he's probably sleeping." <laughs> it's like, it's oh, like, that's right. I mean, I mean, I mean. I mean, I mean, look, Nadella was blindsided by this thing on Friday. He didn't know about it. Um, you know, before the market opened on Monday, like they already did all the meetings, try, tried to fix it and and started the division, announced it all before the, the opening of the markets. Like, I mean, look, I mean, my my I, my, my take at the chai, the, the thing I've never understood is so whenever they do the, the Google, you know, announce whatever the keynote is, I don't even know what the name of their conference is, but you would hear their announcements about, you know, the the audio chatbot, right? Their Google Assist, you know, the thing that was kind of supposed to be like the reason we're all gonna like throw away our iPhone and get a Google phone, right? And I swear, I swear every single time, bro, it's the same exact example. It's like you're hike, you're hiking to, you're going for a hike, you're going to Kilimanjaro, like you're researching your hike. And I'm like, I'm just wondering to myself, they keep using the same example for years. You know, does it like, I, I get that Pichar is probably really into hiking, but it's like, do they not have advisors to give them other examples? Or what I think is more likely is that they probably do give him other examples. He's like, no, no, we're really good with this hiking example. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, there's just no, there's no energy. There's no creativity. I mean, and, and Google's never been good at product that way. You know, just because they have amazing stuff, we, we don't think about it. Like, that's not what they're known for. Like, Apple launches great products. I mean, obviously, like, Nadell is a gangster, you know? Uh, but even there, like, they were, you know, as, 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 as sort of Jason Kalkanakis pointed out on his podcast today, like, you know, like, you know, the question was, why did OpenAI do the deal with Microsoft and not Google? It's like, well, that's what you do. When you're the number two player, like, you do partnerships. Like, you do these things. People people thought Microsoft was crazy for giving OpenAI a billion dollars, you know? But then again, I remember when I was at NVIDIA, you know, I mean, no one really said we were crazy, but, like, you know, just to get time. I mean, we, you know, to train the first big transformer that we did. I mean, it was the second biggest job on NVIDIA's internal GPU cluster. Second biggest job, not the first. And, you know, I don't think people really like complained about it, but like people didn't, you know, it wasn't like a no brainer. It wasn't a no brainer to get, you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars or whatever it costs to train this like one AI model that like might diverge. 
like thankfully like my boss really believed in us and he had the cloud to do it but like i don't think a normal person in the company could have done even that so people forget about that like people people forget about like it wasn't a no brainer for elon to to spend 40 40 million on this you know not 40 billion just 40 million in 2015 i mean the transformer wasn't even invented so you know as these things go along it's 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 you know it has google's attention now I don't know why Bard sucks, but I guess, you know, they're supposed to be coming out with this thing called Gemini, which as a Gemini, I think is going to be amazing, but like, you know, it keeps being delayed. So who knows, you know, um, but I mean, it's definitely true that Google invented most of this technology, or at least their people did. Um, and the company hasn't tried very hard to productionize it. I mean, a lot of those people have left. I mean, Noam Shazir, who was like another legend at Google, left and started Character AI, which now Google has invested hundreds of millions of dollars into. So, um, I think just sometimes it happens, man. Like people just don't know what's going to happen and it's hard to be early and it's, and it's better to just sort of pile in when people do it. I mean, Google put in money into Anthropic too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this, uh, email or this message is from March, uh, 2023. I will just, uh, read it really quickly and then we'll go back in the podcast, but uh, it's from a, uh, he's a researcher, AI researcher at Google. Okay. This is what he told me. Cause I was like, why does Bard suck? Um, uh, for why we suck so much is that the management has been completely unwilling to ship anything for years and is only now w- waking up in a panic. We had models as good as Bard 2.5 years ago, but they stonewalled it forever. The recent Wall Street Journal podcast about this is accurate, but in my opinion, it severely underplays the dysfunctional leadership who have been completely paralyzed by fear of bad press. So that was that's which kind of what you said, uh, you know, a little bit more specificity and detail. Well, 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 look at look at their image models. Like, why did Mid Journey win? Right? Like, you use Mid Journey. You know, people like you use Mid Journey. Like, Mid Journey's actually done really good on product. They have the yeah, best. I pay. I pay for style. it. Yeah, and it's like it's not that Google doesn't have image generation model, but like I couldn't even tell you what it is. I mean, when 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 OpenAI came up with Dali two, and I remember it was hard to get access. I managed to get early access. Because I guess I was cool enough for that, like, but it was a big deal. And Google came up with its model, and it was kind of like, eh, it was okay, it wasn't as good. Midjourney was nothing. Midjourney followed Google, and like now they're everywhere. They have that classic Midjourney style. So it's like I don't know. It's not that Google can't do it, but like I, I don't know. It just there, there, there's a pattern there, right? Well, it's what you're talking about. So you know, in business, <laughs> you can have a great idea, uh, you can work on the R and D, but then you have to execute the product. You know, yeah. so that's just how it goes. Um, you know, we know about in tech, we know about Xerox Park. Uh, in the nineteen seventies, they pioneered a lot of the stuff, like uh, you know, uh, windowing, the mouse. Uh, and Steve Jobs just took the ideas and he executed obviously on the product. Steve Jobs was a technologist, but he wasn't you know was like he wasn't you know an engineering whiz, but he was really great at creating products and you know transformed computing. Um, iPads okay, uh, but then iPhone transformed a lot of things. It's a supercomputer, actually. You know, in your pocket. Actually, Steve Jobs himself. I think I mentioned this on an earlier podcast. You listen to what he said when the iPhone came out. He didn't understand how transformative it would be, actually. But whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, let's assume that. Um, so let me just ask you, just kind of like a you know operational execution question. Okay, so. Altman shows up at Microsoft. Uh, it, he can't go back to OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI is like a kind of like a zombie company in a way. Uh, and then Altman has to reconstitute. Does this give uh, Google an opening uh, or not? What would you say? Yeah, I mean for sure. And and I think that um, I would kind of agree with David Sachs when you know he was sort of saying on uh, Jason's podcast, which is that it really feels like sort of a leveling. You know, I mean. I would compare it even more to a sort of Tower of Babel type situation, you know? And, and, and to be quite honest, from a selfish perspective of someone in this space, I'm kind of a fan. Like, it was getting a little bit tough where OpenAI was like crushing it with the best stuff, getting all the best people. And, you know, like, like I wasn't, I'm not worried about AGI. We talked about that before, but but it's it's like, I think it's good to have multiple players, you know? I think that it's good to have multiple options. And in fact, we were seeing that. I mean, for example, the code completion people, if you see their companies and their demos, they tend to prefer Anthropic. And they would all say, we think GPT-4 is better, but Anthropic has a longer context window. So that's like better for code because, you know, code is very inefficient. Then you put a lot of comments and headers and things like that. And, you know, so I think having multiple options is good. Kind of like how having multiple languages is sort of, you know, the lesson, I guess, from the Tower of Babel story, you know, you know, have your own interpretation. But I think 
I think, um, you know, it, 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 it certainly, it, it's very possible that, you know, Sam and, and Greg and their new venture, you know, could come out ahead, but it would take some time. I mean, they're still apparently waffling about whether they want to come back or rejoin. I mean, the, you know, this shit takes time. They know how to do it. It can be done. Um, even if they sort of disappeared, I think Microsoft probably could keep a lot of it running. Now, now this sort of like the wisdom exists, many people can do it. Open source is, I think, very rapidly catching up. I think people don't appreciate that. I mean, I'm biased being in the open source LLM community. I mean, no one's claiming that open source is better than GPT-4, but I think that like, I think a lot of people at this point think it's like significantly more parameter efficient. So for the same size, you're getting a, like a, a better bang for your model, you know? And on particular tasks, it's better tuned to those tasks. And I mean like in a real way, not in a bullshit way to beat the metrics. That's a problem also, that's a real problem. But I think that problem is a little bit overstated. If you actually look at these models, I've got some blogs coming out and very specific things that you as a user would care about. There's plenty of models that are already like out competing GPT-4. And, and part of it is that, you know, I think a lot of people were, were disappointed at demo day they didn't announce GPT-5. Like where's the next big model, you know? So I, I think we're already seeing, um, I think we're already seeing other people um, not just Google, but I think other players, I mean, I think that, I mean, like I said, Anthropic is a real player open, you know, sort of some of the, um, some of the open source things are players. I mean, um, a lot of people don't know, but obviously like there's a big, big breakthrough with Llama 2 from Facebook, really good model. Again, not better than GPT-4, but actually more efficient. And even small things that really matter, they solve. For example, actually some coding is better, um, not to get too, too into the weeds, but the way that the string is encoded, you know, the sequence are encoded. It's a combination of word parts. Um, that's what, a, you know, that's what, that's what GPT does, but it would really like Llama basically had the right mixture of some things are bytes, some things are digits, some things are like word parts and it's just better. And after that, everyone uses it. And then some of the, some of Llama's team from Facebook left to start this company called Mistral, which is basically an improvement on Llama. That's again, even smaller, but more efficient. So like, you're really starting to see multiple people, you know, like there's 700 people at OpenAI, but there's also hundreds of people, let's just say of a comparable quality, you know, sort of not exactly collaborating, but working in the open source world, building on top of each other. Um, and I think there's not, it's not inherently obvious who is going to win, you know, um, to put, to, to put it one way. Like, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, as we close out, uh, I want to talk about uh, kind of like less computer sciencey things, but you know, Effective altruism, long term long termism, and uh, you know, effective accelerationism, uh, because these are some things that are. It's all very new. It's all very weird, and it's all very word cell compared to what we were talking about. But it, it, I think it actually did. I mean, I think it explains some of what's happening here. So we, I, I want to get into it. Um, I do also want to start out with, uh, you know, I know people who are. You know, working. I like. I have a friend who's an artificial intelligence researcher. He's you know pretty conservative guy politically, and uh, he is an effective accelerationist. Now he's conservative, so you know. So like they say, uh, you know, excel and decel. These are the two things. You know, decelerationist and accelerationist. And, and so you might wonder, like, why is this conservative guy uh, uh, an accelerationist? And the reason he gave to me was, look, if we don't do it, China will do it, and I'm an American patriot. And so it gets a little confusing. Um, yeah, so we're talking about these American companies, but look, people know how to do this now. You know, they might not do it as well. China's well behind us, but if we just unilaterally suppress it, if we do a full Butlerian jihad, you know, just suppress this technology, I mean, other countries could do it too, you know? So it's just, that's a thought that I think I want to put out there. But let me just define, and I'm going to use ChatGPT. I think it's like kind of ironic and funny <laughs> to do this, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, like you some, get some definitions out there. Effective altruism, which most of you now know from uh, Sam Bankman Fried, but it's been around for a while. Uh, Toby Ord, uh, you know, at Oxford um, is into it. The GiveLog people were into it. Open Phil's into it. Um, and so, like, you know, what is it? Rational evidence based division, decision making. I think that's pretty straightforward. Focus on impact. So the goal is to do the most good possible with the resources available. And so, this is just like bang for the buck. And sometimes it's like weird and boring, you know, bed nets, you know, for like malaria is one of them. You know, um, a lot of charities, effective altruists will say uh, they don't really do much, 
but you know they support kind of you know this charity and the people and the staff and they also make the people feel good that give the money you know so it's performative they're not into performative charity they're into actually you know getting impact cause neutrality and so instead of a you know specific cause like save the children or animals or whatever um they want to just reduce suffering and you know in the nonprofit uh world you know harm reduction is related to this but it's not quite the same uh you know for example um I know people in effective altruism who say uh, you should get people to eat beef, not chicken. And the reason they say that is uh, it takes so so many more chickens to get killed than cattle. And so that's less suffering if you eat beef instead of chicken. Now, that's kind of weird. Like people don't normally think about it like that. But this is the kind of thing that they do. Uh, okay, like how many animals are being killed in factory farming conditions? Let's reduce that, right? Uh, so cause neutrality means that they sometimes like focus on really strange things. Okay, this is long-term perspective, and it's related to long-termism. Um, you know, they want to concern. Uh, they want to, they're concerned with the long-term future, aim to reduce existential risks that could impact the future of humanity. I'm gonna just say this because I think people can connect the dots. Uh, but uh, you know. I know this for a fact. I'm not speculating. Uh, like I haven't talked to Elon Musk myself, but I know people who have. Uh, and this podcast is not that popular, so I'm just going to say it. Uh, he's pretty much a long-termist. And uh, he has really weird views, partly because he's thinking of the long term. Okay, So he is also kind of a doomer uh, about artificial general intelligence. He's a big fan of Dune. That's how he and Grimes kind of connected back when they were together. Uh, and so Dune has this idea that these thinking machines, computers, uh, enslaved humanity. So he's worried about that. And, you know, he is also a pro natalist. And, you know, he wants the Kwisatz Haderach. Like, he wants the savior. He wants us to create the savior somehow, okay? I'm just bringing this up because, uh, you know, the sometimes richest man in the world is strongly Im influenced by these. You might think it's kooky out there that I'm, you know, some of this stuff. But there are some really rich people, you know, who are really into this. And then also the movement uh, is into altruism and selfless, selflessness. Uh, you know, that's straightforward. I was having a discussion today with a friend of mine who's, uh, you know, he's, he's pretty based. But uh, I'm not going to say who it is. But some of you know who he is. He's been on this podcast. But there's that's 150 people. So, you know, but it's a he, but that's 90% of them. So, uh, but he was saying, I don't see why they care so much about human extinction will be dead. Okay. Um, and that's normie brain from the perspective of an EA long-termist. Like, you know, they, they care that, uh, you know, I don't know, something could happen a thousand years from now. We all get exterminated, whatever, you know, now this leads to like weird paranoia and extremism, but I just want to say they do. And this is actually related to some of the ecological activists. Uh, you know, the climate, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, the, the climate emergency people, right? Uh, the Extinction Rebellion, whatever. Those people are kind of kooky. But it's actually the same sort of impulse where it's like, look, I don't really care about your first world, you know, uh, how dare you uh, live your first world lifestyle when we're going to destroy the whole world. The reality is I don't actually think we're going to destroy the world. I have an empirical disagreement with these people. But that is what they think, and this is where some of the long-termism comes from. Uh, I've been talking for a while, but I, I do want to get to um, get to uh, effective accelerationism, which is kind of a new, mostly online thing. Uh, Mark uh, Andreessen uh, wrote something about it, basically, where – so accelerationism is this idea that um, <clears throat> you, know, you just like kind of like go towards this endpoint, which – some people would say it's bad, you know. Uh, accelerationism sometimes comes out of actually left-wing Marxism where you expose the contradictions. Uh, so, for example, in the Soviet Union, or the Soviet Union, uh, to some extent, the 1930s encouraged the Nazis uh, as opposed to the Social Democrats who were center-left uh, because they encouraged, the, uh, they encouraged the German Communist Party not to ally with the center-left because they thought – the Nazis were so morally and intellectually uh, and politically bankrupt that it would be better for the Communist Party if the Nazis came into power and people would see how bad they are and they would go to communism 
Whereas if it was social democrats, um, you know, maybe they would not go to communism, and that's bad. And so that this is, you know, exposing the contradiction. So that's accelerationism is like that. There's other types of accelerationism. You know, there are people who are like, it would be great if America collapsed because we need a hard times to create hard men, right? That's accelerationism. Um, ameliorism ameliar- is, you know, kind of like more gradual, and you try to do the best short term thing, and it's more, you know. Small ball, whatever. Okay, effective accelerationism, though, is the idea that this is going to happen and it could do great things. We could use the technology to do great things. Um, and, uh, you know, we should embrace AI because AI is a tool. Uh, you know, I think there's a spectrum of people, but, like, there's some people who are like, it's not dangerous at all. Come on, just be chill. It's just another tool. And, you know, we could, like, cure cancer. Like we could do so much stuff with drug development. Who knows? All of these things could like magically start happening. And so effective accelerationism is actually arguing in a way it is the utilitarian view. If you are a decel, if you want deceleration because you care about existential risk, they don't think existential risk is a thing. So that means that you want to keep us in the Stone Age because we're, we're going to view this as the Stone Age someday is what they say. And people are miserable. People are dying. They're dying. Their morbidity is bad. Uh, we could have utopia, you know, if we if we race towards effective accelerationism. This is all new. Effective acceleration was just a, kind of invented in the last year. But um, you know, for example, like online, uh, this uh, Twitter handle Rune. I'm not going to say his real name, but it's close to that. You know, he works at OpenAI. He's kind of a, I don't want to say protege, but he's a big fan of Sam Altman. He's an effective. He's clearly an effective accelerationist. I don't know if he identifies. I, I haven't looked at, looked at his handle, but you know he thinks it's good if like really really smart AI emerges and that we can like do things with it that are cool. So <coughs> I've been talking for a while, Nikolai. Uh, what do you think about all that? I mean, I know it's like kind of like woolly and you know. No, it's 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 really quite interesting. Um, I I definitely you know after my trip to San Francisco, I I definitely identify as an as an EAC now. Um, before I, I found them interesting. Now I, I say, ah, I guess I'm in the tribe. Um, I, I would also take a step back and, and say this, like, I think as many things in today's sort of like meme and ironic world, um, like there's there's only sort of two points of view that are having fun. You know, it's either the doomers all the way to like the Yudkowsky stuff. He's definitely having fun for sure. Like he's enjoying life. It, it's not. It's not just. It's not. It's not just a publicity thing. He's. He's. He's having a good time. And and I think a lot of the the D cells who, I, I have no proof for it, but I think like you said, their ideas are a little bit wacky and they're having fun too. They're having a good time. I mean, I've known a lot of effective altruists in, in my life. Usually wealthy Silicon Valley people who had sort of a uh, a windfall from a uh, you know a company going public, let's just say. And you know, do they do a lot of good? I don't know. They clearly meant it, but they also have a lot of great parties along the way. Like it seemed like a good vibe. You know, you fly around in your private planes and you go to you go to Burning Man and you talk, and you talk about improving the world and long termism. Like they were clearly having a very very good time. You know, and I think in the same way, what I love about EAC is you have people not taking that view because some of us just can't get a, just can't get on with that. You know, I wish I could, I can't, um, and that we're having a good time. Like. Definitely, I don't know about the communists and Nazis. Wasn't quite following you there, but but I think that definitely the the, the modern idea that you know, um, you know that this is going to happen anyway. We might as well embrace it. Um, this will be glorious, and um, like kind of like you said about the Stone Age, like like maybe we'll get to see this this thing in our lifetime. And if people do see it as a modern god, then so be it, right? And I think that's also a fun point of view. Um, you can have a good time with that. And I think the people who are not good, having a good time is sort of the people in the middle, right? Like to, you know, to sort of point out, for example, someone who's obviously a great man and everyone likes is Andrew Ng. But, you know, during the whole like Biden uh, executive order on open AI, so not, not open AI, on, the, on AI, right? Like basically having to register your models, you know, and like the government sort of putting it out there that they're going to restrict things. You know, you have these people making this middle ground point. It's like, well, no, this order is bad, but AI should be regulated in this way. It's like, no one's even reading the end of that paragraph. They're just not the vibe these days. If you write something on Twitter that's over 280 characters, no one's reading it. That's not a slogan. Like, you know, the communists, since you already mentioned, they understood you need slogans, you need simple things. You need to sort of have fun with things. And I think the, the D-cells are having a good time. 
the EAs are having a good time and the EACs are having a good time. And, um, you know, and it does definitely polarize the debate, but I think a lot of these people are actually friends and hang out, you know, like, yeah, I had like a rave during the open AI thing and, and Grimes played and she was like, look, I disagree completely with the point of, you know, the thesis of this party, but I'm going to play for you anyway. And I think that sort of maybe to me sums it all up. Like it's all like, do we mean it? Do we not? I don't know. It's all a little bit of a, uh, it's all a little bit of a, a bit of, bit of fun as well. You know? Yeah. So I want to um, actually give a quote uh, here um, and, you know, and I don't want to, um, I guess what I'll say, you know, and we are, we're both, we're both men of a certain age, you know, uh, we have seen, we have seen things, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to go full tears of the rain cause I'm not going to die right now. But, uh, um, you know, so in 2014, August 2nd, uh, uh, Elon Musk says worth reading super intelligence by Bostrom. This is Nick Bostrom. Um, and I, so I'll just say like, I'm friends with, uh, one of the guys, one of his made Nick Bostrom's researchers in so far as like a lot of the text in, in the book is from, from this guy. I mean, I, I think I'd say Carl Schulman, you know, and if you listen to uh, Dorkesh Patel has, uh, on his podcast, uh, the Dorkesh podcast, he has like an eight hour conversation or something with, with Carl. Carl's great. I've known him for a long time. Uh, I love talking to him. Uh, so Elon says, we need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. Okay. This is not a new thing for him. He's been thinking about this for a long time. You might think he's crazy, but don't say he's insincere. Right. This is this is a, an issue that I do have with some of these people who think that, oh, these EA people are just like new kooks because they didn't hear about EA until FTX. But it's been around. Uh, it, did, it wasn't called EA, but it was definitely EA in the late 2000s uh, in the in Bay Area uh, circles. Peter Thiel was funding some of it, although he wasn't I mean, he's I don't even know what he is. But Elon was also funding some of it. Uh, most people are like I think Dustin Moskowitz, uh, Facebook. Uh, he's funding a lot of this sort of stuff. And so it has legs. It's been around for 15 years in various forms, really 10 years, like in, in a self-conscious form. The last, like, you know, since the FTX period, probably the last three years, uh, it's really, really become salient. And so um, it's not unserious. It's just weird, maybe wrong. I would say that I have... I'm leaning towards uh, EAC mostly because, like, I don't see what the other option is. <clears throat> I, I don't see how the D-cells can do – I mean, Eliezer Yudzkowski says that we should nuke the world and have, like – Yeah, the same thing, centers, right? Like, that's the way Ben Thompson puts it. And that's his point is that he at least is sincere. He's like, look, just, yeah, you know – uh, what is it, you know, like, uh, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot, you know, spite your, you know, leg to whatever the, whatever the metaphor is like, this is yeah. that bad. Cut, cut your nose off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cut your nose off. But, but that's not going to happen. Maybe not. I yeah, don't think that, so. And that's, and that's not what Anthropic is doing, right? Like Anthropic is like, look, we'll take billions, we'll build AI almost as big as GPT-4, but also we'll be more careful. Like that's, I think that's a fun point of view, but it's it's yeah, it's, it's it, there's something strange about it. I mean, I I guess my concern question is just going to be it's you know we're talking about anthropic, we're talking about open AI. Obviously, Google's got its own thing, uh, but you know, I mean, at some point, China is going to have the capacity and resources. I'm saying China mostly because like it's still kind of expensive. Like, I don't think Kuwait will be able to do this. You know, at least the training part. I don't know, um, but who knows uh, if the technology. You know, you guys like you know make a huge breakthrough. But uh, my point is like, it's going to be here. It's going to happen. And uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, safety is important, but like ultimately like we need to make use of it in a productive way. And I think that that is probably the best bet. Like show people how great, you know, it could do something and then people will start using it for that. And that's optimal. Um, I, I, I don't see, uh, what other way we can make this a positive, uh, kind of like a, a you know a benefit to the human race, which is what I think you think. I mean, talking to you, talking to a lot of computer scientists, you know, your probability that this is going to be like create like Skynet, Terminator, is very low. Uh, a lot of you guys, you know, so that means that it's a tool, and it might be able to do great things like nuclear weapons. Nuclear technology is also a tool, and it can destroy the world. You know, this could do some 
we could, maybe we could do some fucked up shit. Maybe someone could do some fucked up shit with it. I don't know. But, uh, you know, assuming that it's not going to, like, wake up and be malevolent, it's a tool, just like the sword is a tool. With the axe, I think I use this analogy. With the axe, like, you could cut down a forest with the axe and, like, you know, clear it for farming. Or you could, like, bash, you know, kill people with the axe, right? And so if this is a new axe, like, let's figure out uh, what to do productively with it. I think we hit on, like, most of the things that, that I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, and uh, you, know, you talked, to, you know, you got a little bit into the weeds, which I actually do appreciate, actually. Um, I think people do want to hear a little bit more of that, opposed to just the drama and the soap opera aspect of it. But um, do, is there anything that you think we need to talk about or that you want to mention that would give, like, people a little bit of insight about what's going on? Um, you know, I will be posting this soon. As you know, I already told you. The, so there's not going to be a huge gap. Um, I mean, who knows? Something could happen overnight, and this could be just totally out of date. <laughs> I, I the, the way things are going, like you're laughing because, come on, guys, like if you've been keeping track of this, like it's been zigging and zagging. So I gotta like get this out now, <laughs> uh, just so that uh, you know uh, this doesn't like get ahead of us. But yeah, is there anything else you would like to say, Nikolai? Well, I think a couple things. Um, what one is definitely that, you know. Speaking speaking with you a few times on this, I mean, I've I've definitely gotten a little bit more open to the to the possibility of you know AI being you know really crazy change in that you know I mean things have things definitely I feel like have accelerated. I mean, I think I I think a lot of us knew this day would come, but it's come here a lot sooner. Even though the progress since GPT four has not been that fast, you know, um, but also like even just the idea that a small number of people can you know can have such an influence at least economically, you know. I mean, it, it, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, I guess it's, it's it's happened before, but never really on this scale, you know. Um, I mean, I guess you can argue Google or Facebook or whatever, but these are things that were already out there. I mean, it was just a better technology for something that already existed. This is really a new thing, you know. As people point out, with ChatGPT, an accidental product. I mean, this really was a research organization that was like finding creative ways to get money. You know, like there's a reason it had this unusual board structure. It wasn't by design. They stumbled into, you know, the biggest, you know, product success, you know, really of all time, possibly, you know, you said you're using it all the time. I mean, even people who are not at Chad GPT very quickly entered the lexicon, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's really, so it does feel, it does feel like we're accelerating and I don't blame people for being scared about that. I don't blame people for being upset about a few people potentially controlling it. So that's one thing. Um, so I, I think it is interesting. I think that, um, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm being too uncharitable to the EA people, but I do think that there's interesting discussions to be had here, and I kind of wish that they weren't recaching of discussions from ten years ago or science fiction books from decades ago, as great as those books were. Like, like I, maybe maybe there's a version that's fresher, you know, that is really like addressing what's actually happening and how people feel about it. You know, it's it's kind of you know to make a terrible analogy. It, it's kind of like Ben Thompson gets super annoyed when people want to apply um, the Sherman Antitrust Act that was written in, um, I think, the 1300s. I mean, a very, very long time ago. So like modern things that are clearly different businesses. And he's like, look, I'm concerned about big tech being too big also, you know, like maybe we should think about that. Maybe we should legislate against that. Maybe we can say, hey, like what can big companies do and not do as opposed to trying to reinterpret this like ridiculous law written by dudes with sidebirds. Uh, you know, no offense to uh, you and the New Argentinian president, you know, so that's <laughs> sort of my, <laughs> that's my first take. And then, and then my, my other thing is completely entirely self-promotional, which is that um, we have deep news, which is, you know, an LLM that's actually aware of what's going on in real time. So, um, you know, I think obviously I'm biased as also sort of a player, you know, where do we as a small player sort of fit into this ecosystem? Um, weirdly enough, GPT, you know, I asked GPT uh, for, you know, what, what's your latest up-to-date information? And it still says January, 2022. Now, obviously you're using the version that queries the internet. So that's a little bit different. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I sort of like, you know, no one's sort of, uh, you know, pouring out any, you know, in, in, any tears for, you know, these sort of smaller companies, but I do kind of wonder where, you know, the rest of us fit in, you know, that we're not Google, we're not open AI. We have a small player. I mean, obviously the GPG store was kind of interesting. Um, that I assume effectively is dead because that was Sam's thing, but like maybe it's not dead. If not, somebody else will, will, will launch it. Maybe Microsoft, maybe Facebook. So I think that'll be really interesting to figure out. Like 
where are, where are we going to put these things that really maybe don't, you know, they're not like helping you code. It's not a self-contained product, but like, how can we, you know, sort of, you know, can we have an app store? Are we going to use multiple interaction agents? Are we going to have an agent that like, can sort of, you can plug in your agent that knows about the news or knows about genetics. I'm assuming GPT-4 doesn't know very much about genetics. <laughs> um, you can correct me on that. So I don't know. I think that stuff is very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, I think the last thing I want to say um, is, um, you know, I tweeted this out. Uh, so there's a book called A Fire Upon the Deep. It was written by Werner Vinge, computer scientist. Uh, I met Werner Vinge in 2008 in San Jose at the Singularity Summit at the reception. Um, I was kind of like, I was kind of fanboying, but whatever. Um, and so he, he thinks about um, artificial intelligence and malevolent AI and all this stuff, obviously, as he's a science fiction writer. Uh, I think he's influenced Eliezer and, and people like that. I want, I did, I tweeted out, I was like, you know, a lot of these people have all read A Fire Upon the Deep. So I'm just going to like end with this because, you know, just so people know this. It's a good book. It's a good book. And their sequels are okay, but The, the Fire Upon the Deep is very good. Uh, they basically, uh, a human civilization uh, awakens a malevolent AI and it almost destroys the galaxy. Uh, and, you know, it's a fun book, but I, I, I just want to say like a lot of, people that i know in that originally rationalist and later ea uh community long-term as community read that book and so um you know do it is like a, a do it is like a different reference but do it is very vague about what happened in the past a fire upon the deep is an excellent space opera that talks about you know the fact that the whole galaxy is almost you know rendered lifeless by a malevolent AI. Now, I know that a lot of you guys who don't read science fiction are like, this is ridiculous. But just imagine, you know, all like 80% 80, 80 of these people uh, in this movement have read this book. It's just kind of like, it's a framing device in their head, I think. Like, they really, really do think it's possible. I mean, I, I mean, it's possible, you know? Um, I think that my pro prior was higher before I was talking to you, before I was talking to my friend David Mackay, other people uh, like Rude, um, I'm just like, oh, you know, it's it's not going to be transformative. Now, on the other hand, I do have friends who do think, and, and like Rune, I think thinks AGI is pretty close. He just thinks it's good. Uh, but you know, I have friends who will say, like, you know, they're they're nowhere close to close to getting um, AGI. It's going to be 50 years, and I'm like, I might still be alive, probably not, but I might still be alive, depending on how medicine is. I could still be alive. My kids will definitely be alive. Um, so that's kind of weird that like people just kind of like shrugging it off you know they're like you know 50 years yeah probably you know but um is it going to be malevolent i mean i think you know that's the worst case scenario and you know <laughs> as they say your mi your mileage may vary um and you know people are like perry metzger says that you know the, these uh these ea eliezer yudkowski people they're a cult they're a millenary and death cult and uh you know they take utilitarianism too far and you know, that's not like the purview of, of this podcast, but uh, just, you got to think about it. Uh, there's a soft human sociological side to this that kind of like scaffolds, you know, all this talk about weights and, and whatnot, the models, uh, and the t technology, you know, like GPUs. Uh, and you get you have to like take into account both sides to really understand what's going on. So um, I think the client with that, we've been talking for a while. Uh, I am going to close this and like thank you for. Talking about this on short notice, as usual, you know, sometimes you, you jump in on these, like, you know, current affairs, technology things, and you're my, you're my go-to. Um, everyone should check out, you know, your site, Deep News. Uh, you know, it's in the links and your Twitter and everything like that. So thank you, man. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library Main Branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Rezeeb Khan's unsupervised learning.